Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. Today's episode is all about tips for medical coding job seekers. I'm going to be talking about tips on uh, networking and also about getting prepared for those pre-employment assessment tests. All right, so if you're brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. All right, this question has been coming up more and more and more. <laughs> so as we are navigating in this pandemic and in this COVID world, um, things have changed when it comes to looking for employment. And some of the things are in our control, right? Like about how we are presenting ourselves and some of the things are out of our control. So the things that are in our control that we know that we can either improve on or really start to show our true colors, right? Uh, to a future employer is the things that we can do, which is prepare for the pre-employment assessment tests. Now, every place is different. Every employer is different. Every facility is different and the requirements for their coders is going to be different. Well, Blue, how do I prepare? The main thing that you need to really focus on and make sure that you understand and know is the coding guidelines and how to look up codes in the book. Now, there's going to be things in the beginning that, yes, new medical coders are not going to quite understand until they get into the real world of medical coding. Then it'll be like, oh, <laughs> now I get it. Uh, now I get what the book was trying to say. But there's going to be times when it's going to show in your coding. So if you are if you're coding for the outpatient side and you're still trying to pick up symptoms that are that is inappropriate to pick up when there isn't a definitive diagnosis, that's going to show that you don't really know what you're doing. But even brand new coders who who have studied and, and know and sometimes that they're taught very well can spot those right away. So if you know this is part of your your deal where you're not really picking up things that you like you're supposed to or you're picking up too much then you know that's something that you do need to work on. That is one of those detail things that they're going to try to look at. Uh, every single pre-employment assessment test that I've had all been for the outpatient side, but they have all involved anatomy and medical terminology. Because if you don't know your anatomy and medical terminology, you won't understand the documentation. You have to have a very good grasp of those two things and pathophysiology really, but uh, medical terminology and anatomy before you can actually get into the coding part. Because if you're just looking at it and you're completely lost, it's probably because you don't understand some of the words. If you're not understanding some of the words, you need to start working on your medical terminology. That is a thing that it's going to be forever. You're gonna be learning medical terminology forever. Doctors have 10 years at least in school, right? That they're gonna be concentrating on this stuff. We as medical coders, we either have self-study or we are studying this for nine, 12 or 18 months because hopefully you're in a program that is as long. If you are in a shorter program, I hope it's because you've had experience before in the medical field and just perhaps you're just transferring over to the coding side. Um, but if you are trying to get into this field brand new with just a very short program, you, you really do have to take the initiative to study on your own. And even when you're out looking for a job, you still need to be working on the coding exercises. There are plenty of places for free coding exercises, all right? I did at one time do a Quiz Friday, and I still have the playlist. Um, so if you want to look at that, I will leave the playlist in the description box below. I would do scenarios like coding scenarios and then I would uh, do an, a separate episode talking about the answers and things. All of the episodes have the corresponding um, answer episode attached to them. So uh, if you check out that Quiz Friday list, you'll be able to see that. And a lot of times I do explain how I got to it. Sometimes I just give the answer. So if, it, if it's that I'm just giving the answer, it's usually very straightforward the reason how I was able to get it. So um, there's that. There's also JustCoding.com. JustCoding.com, this is not an ad for them, but I love them. They are amazing. And they have free coding exercises. If you sign up for their free subscription on their website, because they have a paid and they have a free, uh, if you sign up for their free subscription, you get access to all their free quizzes. Now, a lot of times people will write me, 
Lou, you know, what other resources do you have? What, what have you, um, what other things can you tell me? And I ask people, have you gone to the Just Coding uh, website? Well, no, not yet. Guys, go to the website. I'm telling you, they have these free quizzes. And when you answer the quizzes, it'll tell you, and they're broken down by diagnosis coding, procedure coding, and inpatient coding. So when you answer these questions, they will tell you whether you're right or wrong, right? They're little five question quizzes. And that's all. And so it's a good place to start practicing. If you still have your um, any of your exam prep books, this is a good time to go back over and refresh yourself and learn from those books. Because all the time you're taking to study, when you are out applying for jobs, it's going to help. Because when you do those pre-employment assessment tests, it's stuff is going to start being oh, like, okay, I remember this, I remember this, I remember this. So not that saying that those questions from the book are gonna be on those tests because they're literally made up by whoever's in the facility. So there's really sort of no way to prepare other than to make sure that you've got all your bases covered, that you understand the coding guidelines, that you know how to look up codes in the book, that you have a pretty good grasp, or if not a strong grasp on medical ter terminology, <laughs> anatomy and pathophysiology. Those things are very important. And it's part of the heavy lifting, guys. It's one of those things that you absolutely have to do. And if you get discouraged, think about it. Um, don't get discouraged because if you do, then all the time you spent studying is going to be for naught, right? So you want to make sure that you're still continuing to study. You're still continuing to practice as you're out there in the real world looking for a job. The other thing is, of course, people are going to tell you no, especially if you're brand new. Uh, you have no experience. Um, get experience and come back and apply with us. Here's the thing. You still have to apply with them anyway, because when you are out applying, sometimes facilities have a hard time getting qualified candidates to apply. And when they have this issue, sometimes they're willing to take on brand new medical coders. But how can they do that if you haven't put out your resume to them? Right. So you want to make sure that you're putting yourself in the right place at the right time to look for these jobs and to have them know who you are. Your resume, I'm telling you guys, is is your your calling card. This is what is going to get um, the employer's attention. It is what is going to possibly get your foot in the door uh, just by having a really good resume. Your resume cannot be just a very lackluster, don't care, I'm just gonna put a little bit on here, whatever I can. Uh, it's got to be all your transferable skills. You got to look at those job listings, guys, and you cannot have the same resume every single time. You can have a template and you can have like different things that are highlighted on certain templates, uh, but you need to make sure that you have a variety of different choices of resumes to choose from when you're sending them out because these employers are potentially getting hundreds of of resumes, hundreds of cover letters, and you need to be able to stand out. So if your resume is only saying very few things, very minimal, well, I don't have a lot of experience. Yes, but you may have a lot of transferable skills. And those transferable skills is basically if you look at the job listing and see if anything that you have matches what's in that job listing. And I say this lots and lots of times, and it's it's so important to pay attention to those details because that's where those employers are looking. If your resume looks very boilerplate and it looks like everybody else's next, at least that's what I would do. If I was a hiring uh, manager, I would definitely say next. If I see no effort put into their resume next, and it doesn't matter if you're like, well, I don't like to write resumes. You're going to have to get used to writing guys because you're going to have to write when you are in the facility when you finally do get the job when you need to start querying the providers you're going to have to start writing <laughs> and you're going to have to sound very professional and you're going to have to put your best foot forward so get used to it uh you don't have to love it but you do have to do it it is part of what we do and you know there's there's going to be times when you're not going to know what to say you're going to be like well what should i put on my resume there's plenty of templates out there that will help you if, you, if you're looking, right? Uh, I do offer resume reviews. 
Um, I will leave my rates in the description box below. Again, it's very reasonable. $25 for the first hour, $15 for the second hour in the same session. We go over your resume and we talk about the highlights and some of the things that you can dress up on your resume. And sometimes it takes a second person looking at your resume to be like, oh, okay, well, here's, here's what I see. And in being a professional in the medical coding field for over 10 years, I, I've seen a lot. And when it comes to new people and hiring new people, um, I've never hired anybody new, but I've definitely trained brand new medical coders. So I do know what they are looking for, these employers, when they are taking a chance on somebody that is brand new. Believe it or not, they do take chances on brand new people. Every single one of us that is in this field now, 98% of us, started with no previous experience. Somebody gave us a chance. It takes a lot of tenacity, it takes grit, it takes uh, persistence in order to get into this field. And so many people can't take that rejection. This is something that I wish would change about the field. <laughs> I can't say that enough, uh, but it's true. You know, uh, it's just something that's weird. This, this field is weird about that. You know, they want you to have experience, but how can you get it if no one will hire you? It's all about you putting your best foot forward and making sure that you uh, know as much as you can. There's going to be things that you're going to learn in the real world that are going to be different from what you learned in school, and that's okay. But the, the important thing is to try. Another question that I've come across lately is, how can I network when we are in a pandemic world? Well, there's everything that is online. Of course, there's these the online association meetings. Every, um, every association, the two associations, American Health Information Management Association and the American Academy of Professional Coders, both have their um, online meetings. So that is a play, good place to start when they have their uh, chapter meetings. They're going to be virtual. So that is a good place to network. If you are on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is kind of weird, guys, to me <laughs> uh, because it seems like it's a good place to network, but then it's like there's a lot of like... Uh, there's a lot of people that are, I don't know if they're necessarily in the field, but they're just trying to make connections. You know what I'm saying? So I just get a lot of weird um, uh, connection requests when I am on LinkedIn uh, from people that are not even in the health information field. So it's just like, hmm. So you really do kind of have to watch. It's kind of like Facebook, but for professionals. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I do, I do like it. I mean, LinkedIn is pretty cool. You know, I just, I've just started it. So it hasn't been that long. I think I started it last year and I'm up to like a hundred and something <laughs> followers or subscribers or friends or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but it's, it's not a lot, but there's a lot of good information on there too, about the professionalism in the workplace. Um, and like I said, of course you have that, the handful element that are just there just to play around, I guess. Uh, but if you're there for professionalism, you know, it's a really good place to get some um, good information, you know. Uh, and but again, it's going to take you going out there and applying. Uh, it's not always about uh, like having a connection because I didn't have any connections when I started in the industry either. Uh, I had to go back to the school that I was trained at and ask <laughs> for help because I couldn't I didn't know what to do. Everybody was telling me no. And there was nobody like me <laughs> uh, that was on YouTube. And again, YouTube, YouTube wasn't really big for medical coders back then either. So at that time, I mean, I'm sure there were, but it wasn't something like it is now where, you know, there's more people on YouTube and there's more people watching and things like that. So, um, <laughs> uh, but like I'm saying to you guys, these are the things that I've learned in my time. And these are the things that I know that would make things easier for brand new people. So um, I hope you guys heed my advice because it's 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 going to help you if you follow it at least. Um, but sometimes people will question like they don't really want to do that. Well, then don't do it. You know, do, do whatever is, is beneficial for you. Do whatever you feel is correct. You know, um, but like I said, I'm just trying to help you guys out. Don't hire a professional uh, resume writer, whatever you do. Because the cadence of your speech needs to match what you have in your resume. If I was um, seeing somebody with a very nice, very professional looking resume, okay, 
I'm going to expect the person, the candidate, to have the same kind of cadence when they're speaking. And if you go in there and um, you're not speaking professionally or when you're doing your Zoom <laughs> interviews or whatever, uh, or perhaps you're going to the facility and your, your speech is not matching, your writing is not matching, then I'll know that that person did not take the time to do this resume on their own. Nobody's going to know your skills as well as you do. Okay. And if you, and again, if you're saying, well, I don't know how to write it. If you take the time to relax and really think about what it is that makes you unique and you special, then getting it on paper is going to be a lot easier than just having that wall of, I don't want to do this because you have that wall. Then that's what your mind's thinking. I don't want to do this. I'm not going to do it. And so that's why you have to be willing to say, okay, well, um, I, I'm not comfortable yet in writing, but it's okay because I'm going to continue to try to write and I'm going to continue to get better with my skills. So, um, that is my advice uh, for today, but yes, study on anatomy, physio pathophysiology and medical terminology is important. Just as important as your resume and your cover letter and your cover letter needs to be uniquely about you. Why do you want this position? Why would they, uh, why would they be making a good choice hiring you? Those are the things that you can say. All right. Um, know about the places that you're applying guys. If you don't have any idea about that facility, say you're going to go apply at a hospital and they ask you, what do you know about us? And you're like, uh, eh. <laughs> wrong. You know, you need to make sure that you know something. All right. So again, I do, uh, interview uh prep so if you're interested in that rates are the same and they're in the description box below you can contact me about that um let's see what else what else uh i think that's pretty much about it but you still need to be professional even if you are on zoom doing an interview you still need to be professionally dressed all right uh this is not a t-shirt deal t-shirt t-shirt and jeans deal this is not that um, a lot of people will say, well, you know, I kind of want something that I'm going to be comfortable, you know, working uh, in. Well, then get, you know, you can get a job like doing something very creative because then you can wear whatever. When you're in a professional work environment, you need to be dressed professionally. If you're going to be at home, let's, you know, be still professional anyway. Um, you can wear polos, you know, something professional with a collar. You know, you want to make sure that you look presentable. And in the off chance that you do have to have a meeting spontaneously <laughs> and talk to somebody at your workplace on camera, because as we all know, uh, Zoom, like Microsoft Teams, that is, those things are all very popular now. <laughs> so it is just as easy as, as, you know, having a conversation with somebody face to face, but you still want to look your best. Okay. You want to look your best. You want to sound your best. And you want to continue to study so that way you, that you can get those positions um, that you want. And to close out, I will say this. If the position says we want one, three, or five years of experience, apply anyway. Especially if you're applying at a place that you have to physically go. If you're trying to apply for these remote coding companies, they're probably going to tell you no. Um, because remote coding companies have their thing where they want people to already have had experience. And that is understandable because if we were not in a pandemic world, that would be the standard where nobody, if you're brand new, works at home the first time. But I've had many, many viewers on my channel uh, write me and say, Blue, I just got my first job. I'm working at home and I'm really scared. <laughs> it's, it's understandable to be scared because you should want to be around other people, especially veteran coders, when you first uh, enter this field, because this is not going to be as simple as, oh, well, the computer will decide what codes I use. No, it is reasoning, it is looking, it is figuring this stuff out, it is comprehending what you're reading, it is all of those things. So with that in mind, you want to make sure that you have access to somebody that uh, is a veteran coder that you feel comfortable asking questions to, that you make sure that you are doing your research before you go and ask so that it doesn't look like you're constantly running back and forth asking people to help you and you're not trying to help yourself. You've got to be able to help yourself, okay? So 
that is my message for today. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Tomorrow's episode will be Letters to Blue, and I will see y'all then. So um, give this video a thumbs up if it helped you. Share this if it helped you, and I will see y'all on the next video. If you are a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider, or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. I will see y'all next time. Bye!